paper um, is looking at the representation of drunkenness in ostensibly didactic writing and the corrective, but also the potentially destabilizing potential of humor. And we say ostensibly didactic because whilst the material discussed in section one on sermons is quite clearly instructional, the text that forms the focus of section two, Thomas Nash's Pierce panelists is much more tonally suspect. And I'm gonna hand over to Emma now to start section one. Okay, so it's probably no surprise uh, that drunkenness is a frequent target of early modern preachers. In an early, early English books online keyword search, full text word drunkenness and title word sermon, so I wasn't being very nuanced there, produced well over 200 results. Usually moments when drunkenness features in a catalogue of sins, including other offences such as pride, gluttony, covetousness, lechery, wrath, etc. Surveying these sermons and um, four key ideas stand out, ideas which, as we shall see um, in Cathy's half of the paper, also run through didactic writing outside of the pulpit. So firstly, um, drunkenness is distinguished as what we might term a gateway sin. Its particular danger lies in its ability to lead people further into sin, particularly licentiousness and adultery. So Anthony Huggett uses a metaphor very similar to a gateway, claiming that drunkenness is the gallery and way of whoredom. While George Benson opts for a military metaphor, he says, when the devil wounds or kills by any sin, excepting drunkenness, he pierceth with a single bullet, one sin only. But when by drunkenness, then by chain shot, many sins linked together. Secondly, uh, drunkenness was portrayed as leading man to corrupt his creation in God's image and become beastly. And this idea of beastliness um, recurs. So Henry Smith observes, in drunkenness, there is no difference between a man and a beast, saving that one can stand and the other cannot. Or in John Boyes' analysis, a drunkard is become rather a beast than a man, nay worse than a beast, for we cannot enforce a beast to drink more than he need. Specifically, preachers often draw a connection between the drunkard and swine. So this is George Benson. He says, away with all beastly cogitations, away with cruelty, that tiger, away with deceit, that fox, with lust, that goat, with drunkenness, that swine. Thirdly, this beastliness can play into what can feel like a very theatrical depiction of drunkenness when it's included in a series of dramatic personifications of sin. So I've got space just for one example. Uh, this is Thomas Case talking about all the sins you can discover in the suburbs. And he starts uh, with the adulterer and then he goes on. Next of all, without you shall see many of the swinish sons of Bacchus come reeling out of the schools of drunkenness, breathing and belching out nothing but the froth of ale, devilish and fearful blasphemies to the everlasting shame and reproach of man, to the scandal of the holy profession of Christianity, to the certain corrupting, corrupting and evil example of others. And so he continues at, at great length. And you can see that once again, drunkards are depicted as swine. And then lastly, fourthly, uh, there is a trend among preachers to associate particular sins with particular nations. And drunkenness is usually associated with Germany. Um, so Thomas Adams explains, if we should gather sins to their particular centers, we would appoint pride to Spain, lust to France, poisoning to Italy, drunkenness to Germany, and Epicurism to England. In another sermon, he then warns, it has been said that Germans are great drinkers, but if England plies her liquor so fast as she begins, Germany is like to lose her charter. But where does humour come into this? Does laughter have a role to play in preachers' denunciations of drunkenness? I found this quite a tricky question to address. Certainly the beastly depictions of the drunkard breathing and belching in a froth of ale seem funny, at least they do to me. And there is clearly humour in Smith's joke about the only difference between a drunkard and a beast being that one can stand and the other can't. 
But I think there are also some anxieties when it comes to deploying comedy in sermons on drunkenness. And to explore this, I want to look at Henry Smith's pair of sermons, Looking Glass for Drunkards. Smith was something of a pulpit celebrity. Apparently he was commonly called the silver-tongued preacher and drunkenness is a frequent target of his sermons. But it's given most extended treatment in this looking glass for drunkards. I've done, uh, Smith takes as his text Genesis 9 verses 20 to 21 and this is a moment in Genesis um, it's after the flood um, after Noah's been saved in the ark and he arrives on dry land and the first thing he does is to plant um, a vineyard um, and then he samples his first vintage and gets drunk um, and goes for a lie down naked in his tent where he's then discovered by his sons. Now, much of Smith's sermon echoes idea I've already touched on. Most notably, he presents drunkenness as a deformed beastliness. So he claims, it is a wonder that any man should be drunk that has seen a drunkard before, swelling and puffing, foaming and spewing and groveling like a beast. For who would be like a beast for all the world? And they Look upon the drunkard when his eye stares, his drivels, his tongue falters, his face flame, his hands tremble, his feet feel. The swelling, puffing, flaming, trembling and reeling seem to be presenting us with a picture, an object of comedy. But then, just when he's getting into his stride, Smith pulls back, shifting the tone with a direct question, how ugly, how monstrous, how loathsome does he seem to thee? Any laughter is suddenly made to, see to seem inappropriate. Now, one reason um, for this might lie in Smith's and his congregation's awareness of the decorum expected from a preacher. Preaching manuals heavily influenced by classical writers on rhetoric stress that while preachers should use actio or gesture to convey emotion, this should be within carefully regulated parameters. As Kate Armstrong explains, gestures should reflect the emotional mood of a speech rather than acting out its contents. So Richard Barnfield, author of one of the more famous um, manuals says, a reverend gesture of the body is to be, the body stable and straight up, head not wagging unseemliness in countenance and gesture is to be avoided. So Smith then needed to be careful that his description of a drunkard did not become a performance of a drunkard and reigning in laughter may have been part of that balancing act. But a second anxiety about laughter becomes apparent in the second sermon in which Smith, Smith addresses the next verses in Genesis in which Noah's son discover him drunk and naked. So the verses are, and when Cham, the father of Canaan, saw this of his father, he told his two brethren, his two brothers without, and then took Shem and Japheth a garment and put it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father with their faces backwards so that they saw not their father's nakedness. Here, Smith emphasizes the difference between the brothers' responses. Cham, he argues, sins twice, firstly in scorning his father and then in drawing his brothers to the same fault. Cham, thinking that his brethren had been as shameless as himself, thought this a merry May game to make them sport. Come with me, saith he, and I will show you my father naked. Shem and Japheth, however, show the correct response refusing to look at their father and covering up his nakedness. Now this analysis of how to respond to drunkenness surely has consequences for preachers. There is clearly a temptation to mock, to make sport. But Smith is clear that if we do indulge in this, then we follow Sham, who laughed at that which might make him weep. So Smith seems to be constructing a very careful line between satirical denunciations of drunkenness and derisive scorn. And he's not alone in this. A number of other preachers make similar allusions to a problematic relationship between drunkenness and laughter. 
John Boyce complains that the merry lie, cogging and jesting are the chief props of the drunkard's tottering estate. While Edward Elton specifically criticizes those who not only glory in their strength to pour in strong drink, but will bestow much cost on others to make them of their own wretched condition, even when drunken like themselves, that they may sport and laugh at them. So preachers are acutely aware of the connection between drinking and laughter. Their challenge is to exploit the corrective potential of laughter while ensuring their sermons do not become complicit with the sinful laughter of the drunkards. Uh, and it's uh, now over to me, Cathy, uh, and section two, uh, where we're gonna focus on uh, Thomas Nash. And that ambiguity of tone and the degree to which we might end up laughing with, rather than disprovingly at the drunkard, um, runs through the second section of the paper. Um, so Nash, at first glance, seems an unlikely moralist. He was the known associate of and collaborator with the notoriously dissolute Robert Greene, whose death was attributed by his enemy, Gabriel Harvey, to a surfeit of pickled herring and Rhenish wine. Nash was further infamous as the author of the pornographic poem, The Choice of Dal Valentines, which is also known as Nash's Dildo, uh, and participated in an extended vituperative literary quarrel with Harvey, which grew so heated that the works of both men featured on the list of the forbidden books in the Bishop's Ban of 1599. Nonetheless, in his most successful, most reprinted work, Piers Penniless, uh, 1592, Nash proclaimed himself a great fan of the silver-tongued Smith, whom we ju we've just met, uh, calling him such a plausible, i.e. praiseworthy, pulpit man. The attack on drunkenness that that work contains also expresses similar ideas to those found in the sermons that Emma has just discussed, including S Smith's sermon on Noah's drunkenness. Notably, these ideas include first the idea that drunkenness leads to other sins, such as lechery or wrath. So the chief spur unto wrath is drunkenness. Nash's protagonist, Pierce, proclaims at one point. And secondly, the idea that drunkenness is self-destructive. In Pierce's words, the drunken drunkard is thirsty after his own destruction. And we might want to compare that with Smith asking how many things fly out when the wine goes in? How is it then that he which loveth, loveth himself can be so cruel to himself that he should love his life and shorten his life, that he should love his wealth and consume his wealth, that he should love his credit and crack his credit. Thirdly, we've got the idea that drunkenness <clears throat> is dehumanizing. Here, both writers resort to the convention of categorizing drunkards as different types of beast. Uh, and for Nash, these include the ape who leaps about, making a fool of themselves, the lion, the violent drunk, the swine who is lumpish and sleepy, the sheep who thinks themselves wise in their cups, um, the goat who gets lecherous, and the fox who is crafty drunk. Nash's Pierce Penniless is a peculiar text and its tone is hard to pin down. It's voiced through its impoverished protagonist, a, a university graduate who's trying unsuccessfully to make a living by writing. Down on his luck, besieged by bailiffs, worried where his next meal is coming from, and railing against a world where patrons prove ungrateful and less talented people thrive, Pierce decides to pen a supplication to the devil in a desperate bid to induce the devil to liberate money from the uncharitable cormorants who hoard it. And the paper monster, his words, uh, that he creates comprises the bulk of the book, and it's a scabrous scattergun attack on all sections of society. And this um, supplication, this scattergun attack, is structured as a parade of the seven deadly sins, which is also a favourite motif of Elizabethan preachers. Uh, and Nash's stroke Pierce's targets are many and various, from usurers charging excessive interest and luring feckless young men into debt, to pedantic preachers who subject their congregations to excruciatingly dull sermons botched together from other theologians' works. Uh, and included in this tirade in the section on gluttony is an extended complaint of, i.e. about drunkenness. And at just over 1,400 words, this comprises about 8% uh, of the supplication of the, the paper monster. Drunkenness also resurfaces later in the work in Pierce's defense of playgoing when he argues against the anti-theatricalists that plays stop people frittering away time and money in the capital's drinking establishments. 
So uh, according to Pierce, vintners, alewives and victuallers surmise that if there were no plays, they should have all the company that resort to them by boozing and bear bathing in their houses every afternoon. And Nash does have a vested interest here as a writer of plays. Uh, and Pierce further evokes the figure of the drunkard in a roll call of sinners that he imagines suffering posthumous terrors, torture, sorry, contra passo, as in Dante's Inferno, where the punishment fits the crime. And this roll call places a drunk, drunkard alongside the food glutton and the fornicator, but also uh, with much more serious sinners, the usurer and the murderer. Um, but where the murderer and the usurer undergo physically painful penance, respectively forced to swallow molten gold and continually being stabbed with daggers, but never dying, the drunkard's fate um, to carouse himself drunk with dishwash and vinegar and surf it four times a day with sour ale and small beer is to endure an assault on their taste buds and to consume things with minimally intoxicating <coughs> effect. Drunkenness, in short, features prominently in Pierce's critique of contemporary society and, as in Smith's sermons, is treated as a sin, a sin which is presented as worse than overindulgence in food. Um, at one stage, um, Pierce said that he's going to um, descend from gluttony and meat to superfluity in drink. So he's kind of going down the moral hierarchy, as sort of the idea that, that gets worse as you go down. However, Pierce's denunciation of drunkenness goes beyond conventional, uh, the conventionally moral sphere and its potential detriment to the state of one's soul. Um, drunkenness is represented as a foreign vice, behaviour which was once thought dishonourable in, the, in England until England's recent contact with the Dutch during their lingering wars. And that's a reference to the protracted struggle for independence from Spain, which began in 1568 and would continue well beyond Nash's lifetime. And it's not just the consumption of alcohol that Pierce frames as a problem, but the culture that accompanies it. Now he is nobody that cannot drink supernagulum, carouse the hunter's hoop, quaff up sea freeze cross with health, gloves, mumps, frolics, and a thousand such domineering inventions, Pierce complains, reeling off a list of drinking games and rituals, which is similarly peppered with hints of foreign innovation. Drinking supernagulum is explained in a marginal note as a device new come out of France, which is after a man had turned up the bottom of the cup, to drop it on his nail and make a pearl with that that is left, which if it's shed and he cannot make stand on by reason there's too much, he must drink again for his penance. So it's the idea that you should only have at most a drop uh, in the cup um, because if it's just a drop, it will kind of hold the, the kind of uh, su uh, surface tension will hold the drop uh, on your nail. If there's more than that, it'll spill and then you've got to kind of take a, a uh, another drink in penance. Um, the other drinking games and rituals are left unexplained, perhaps because they're sufficiently familiar to Nash's readership. Um, so I sort of work to try and reconstruct them. So the hoop would seem to refer to the bands around the court pot and therefore the quantity of liquor uh, between the hoops. And hunters seem to be associated with enthusiastic and plentiful consumption. So presumably this refers to the downing of one or more hoops of alcohol. Um, drinking health, toasting people was a regular target for moralists, as in William Barlow's 1596 translation of Roderick Lavater's uh, sermons, where many drinking to health drink themselves out of health and reason, out of wealth and religion. Gloves is more obscure. The OED suggests that these are some kind of drinking vessel, citing Thomas Decker's Gull's Horns book from 1609 as the only quotation, and that refers to the Englishman's health, his hoops, cans, half cans, gloves, frolics, and flap dragons. Um, mumps are grimaces, so the faces you make when drinking or drunk, uh, and then frolics are merrymakings, usually somewhat uh, indecorous ones. So the list continues to connect heavy drinking with foreign customs. So upsy freeze means after the Frisian fashion uh, and cross may indicate at this point that the drinker passes the cup across to their neighbor or that they both drink at the same time over interlocked arms, which um, is apparently a German drinking practice. Uh, and the phrase domineering inventions is a further dig at the low countries. Um, it's a very re re recent loan word uh, into English. It's derived from the Dutch domineren, one meaning of which besides rule over was to feast luxuriously. So the use of the word casts these customs as both dissolute and coercive. 
There is, however, the issue of tone. Um, how seriously are we meant to take Pierce's diatribe? Besides the fact that the description of drinking games here gives explicit instructions on how to play an allegedly new device, drinking supernaculum, Nash also deploys rhetorical figures which have humorous potential. Not least of these are the use of hyperbole, as when the general rules and injunctions of drinking are described as being as good as printed precepts or statutes set down by act of parliament. Uh, and he also uses the potentially humorous um, trope of personification, of pers personation, sorry, prosopopeia, when Piers ventriloquizes a drunken braggart or Frenchified in his soldier's suit, at uh, this point slipping into direct speech as he stands upon terms with God's wounds, you dethonomy, sir, you do me the disgrace if you do not pledge me as much as I drunk to you. So there's a bit of play acting in the middle there. Admittedly, um, as Kate alluded to yesterday, early modern humour was frequently portrayed as a corrective tool. Um, so in Thomas Wilson's words from the 1553 art of rhetoric, the occasion of laughter and the mean that make us merry is the fondness, the filthiness, the deformity and all such evil behaviour as we see to be in other. Yet dramatic and dialogic texts which show people laughing rather than theorising laughter do give a much more complex and less derisive picture of laughter. So laughter isn't purely a corrective tool, although that's the kind of dominant view that you get from the theoretical literature of the time. And further to that, Nash is elsewhere openly scornful of moralists who resting places of scripture against pride, whoredom, covetousness, gluttony and drunkenness, so that kind of parade of, set of the deadly sins, extend their invective so far against the abuse that almost the thing remains not whereof they admit any lawful use. So he kind of um, criticizes and um, ridicules the kind of excessive use of moralizing. Um, and Nash's specific target there is probably Philip Stubbs, whose two volume work, The Anatomy of Abuses, is echoed in the title of, of that work of Nash's, The Anatomy of Absurdity. Um, so Nash then is sort of um, his stance on moralizing and that sort of use of a parade of the devon, seven deadly sins to denounce human behavior is sort of slightly problematic and not necessarily straightforward. Uh, and further to that, many of the drinking practices that Pierce denounces appear in a much more celebratory vein in Nash's dramatic interlude, Summer's Last Will and Testament, which was written contemporaneously with Pierce Penniless in late summer 1592 uh, and performed for Archbishop Whitgift's household in his palace at Croydon. Um, and these, the, the drinking rituals appear in the section that feature the irrepressible Bacchus. And that section is undoubtedly meant to entertain the audience, even as Bacchus forces drink down the throat of Will Summers, who's the show's compare, chorus and fool. Uh, and certainly as an audience, we are meant to favor Bacchus's excess over the frugality of a decidedly unfestive Christmas, who's described as a pinchback cutthroat churl uh, and is one of the villains of the piece. Uh, and I'm now going to hand you over to Emma to conclude uh, the, the paper. Okay, so <clears throat> to conclude very briefly, um, this paper has highlighted the significance of drunkenness raised to the level of a sin alongside the traditional seven sins in early modern didactic writing. But we found the place of humour to be more problematic. This is in part because at such a temporal and cultural distance, humour can be hard to recover and easy to misread. There is a definite idea of decorum governing early modern culture, policing what behaviour is appropriate and inappropriate in different spaces, on different occasions and in different genres. And this might be the reason why Smith is hesitant about pushing the comedy of his descriptions of drunkenness. It also helps to explain the problems of responding to Piers Penniless, a text which defies generic classification. During a private performance in an archbishop's household, drunkenness can provoke communal laughter and frugality produce disdain. Such responses would be out of place in the ecclesiastical spaces under the archbishop's jurisdiction. But humour is also problematic because, like beauty, it is both culturally constructed and in the eye of the beholder. Once evoked, it isn't necessarily easily contained. <laughs>